Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm just going to be begin with a, a few thank yous um, before we pray and announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Steve O'Hearn. Um, he was uh, the one who came up with this topic for our event. And he had contacted Lake County Right to Life by email asking if we could do this. And it was presented at the board, and we thought it was a wonderful idea. It was unanimously accepted. So thank you, Steve, for this idea. I also want to thank St. Mary of the Assumption Parish for allowing us to use their uh, gym. Uh, I want to thank you uh, to Cornerstone of Hope. They have resources for to help with the grieving process, and uh, they are one of our guest tables on the side over there. And I also want to thank Dawn Slyke, who is filming our event. That's her camera, but she is filming our event, so thank you. Um, in case you haven't seen it, we do have a Nursery of Heaven print raffle in the back. Uh, the tickets are a dollar a piece or six for five dollars, and the print is on display if you'd like to purchase any of those. We also have a free drawing. You're only allowed one ticket per person. Uh, we're giving away two books, and uh, we'll be announcing winners uh, at the end of the program. Uh, we also have Christian Scarves present. Um, they're fundraising for a new Women's Center, Project SOS, here in Mentor, and they are hoping to open up uh, this spring, which is wonderful. We kill over 300 babies in Lake County, and this is a much needed resource. They um, are like Maya and Bella Women's Center, if you are familiar with them. So this is another type of women's center that is coming in. Also, there's free t-shirts at our table that we had left over from the fest, uh, free for the taking while supplies last. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, John Noel. He'll be leading us in our opening prayer, and he serves as uh, director for Cleveland Praise for Life, and they host the 40 Days for Life campaigns in uh, the Cleveland area. So please welcome John. Thank you, Jackie. Before we uh, pray the 40 Days for Life campaign prayer for the 2020 cam spring campaign, I just wanted to comment on how fortunate we are, how blessed we are in the state of Ohio and especially Northeast Ohio for all the pro-life uh, organizations that we have up here. Pastor Walt commented when he was in San Francisco that Ohio is a pro-life state and compared to a lot of other states it truly is. And in each of these organizations there's um, a lot of dedicated people that lead, that, you know, as team members help that organization and the mission that they uh, want to accomplish. And in order to be pro-life there's, you know, a couple things. You have to be prayerful and then there has to be activism. You have to, activ you have to be activated to educate, to be educated, to witness on the sidewalks, and then you have to be prayerful. So we encompass up in Northeast Ohio all those organizations. And I just wanted at this time to honor Jackie, who for eight years now has served as a director of Lake County Right to Life. And I know, as an, another leader, and if you've ever led, as Dawn has led Lake County prior to Jackie, and I think it's about eight years, you and I started around the same time, um, to be uh, that dedicated, that committed, and I can guarantee you that the job that Jackie took when she first took it is nowhere near the same as it is now. There's a much more of a workload. And uh, I just wanted to honor Jackie at this time. Thank you. Now I can plug 40 Days for Life. <laughs> every hour of every day of every year for 47 years, 152 babies have been killed in an abortion. Think about that. Because 60, 62 million, that's something I can't, I don't even fathom that. I can't even understand 62 million. But I do understand 152 babies every hour of every day, of every month, of every year for 47 years losing their lives in an abortion. So we, what do we have to do? Can we stop that on our own? No, we can't. 
So we have to pray. We have to let the Lord win this fight. And the Lord will win this fight for us. And uh, we've made remarkable strides in Ohio. I think there's only eight surgical abortion facilities remaining in Ohio. So when you think about the, the population of Ohio, I think there's 150 surgical abortion facilities in California. So just compare that disparity. But anyway, prayer works. Prayer on the sidewalk even works better because uh, the abortion facility directors and workers that have been converted and give their testimonies will tell you that when there's people praying on the sidewalks, up to 75% of the women scheduled for, the mothers scheduled for an abortion will turn away. They won't show up. So that's the importance of the prayer. So if you have on your seat, I put a prayer card, I put one on all the tables. And uh, if you'll join with me in this campaign, it begins February 26th, Ash Wednesday, continues to Palm Sunday. For those that you that can come to our kickoff rally, it's on Tuesday, the day before the campaign starts. That's Tuesday, February 25th. It's at St. Justin Martyr uh, in Eastlake in their gymnasium. And Father Daniel Bowen, uh, Mercedarian Friar, will be our keynote speaker. 7 o'clock is when it starts. we got pizza wings and stuff, so bring your appetite too. And uh, we can kick off the spring 2020 campaign. Isn't it funny to say 2020? The 2020 spring campaign with a great kickoff. I would like to start our prayer. Let's call on God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And if you'd go to the red band on the front, there's a scripture verse that Father James gave me along with the prayer from Jeremiah. We'll start with that. For I know well the plans I have in mind for you, plans for your welfare and not for woe, so as to give you a future of hope. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, and I will change your life. Abba, I am your child. I love you. Thank you for loving us as you loved your beloved son, Jesus. Through the gift of mercy flowing from his pierced heart, make us so sensitive to the presence of your Holy Spirit that has dwelt within us since we were born anew in baptism. Share your mind with us in the plans you have made from eternity. With every breath, strengthen our resolve to protect the life of those unborn. With every morning, illumine the hearts of those who seek it to darken those hearts that have just begun to beat for you. Secure the dignity of all your children and transform those whose eyes have not yet seen the hope of life in yours. Abba, remind us that we are destined to live in your family forever. Joseph, protect us. Mary, embrace us. Jesus, stay with us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. God is good. All the time. Thank you. So today uh, we have um, three panelists. Um, they will be sharing their experiences with loss uh, by miscarriage. And it is our hope that their stories will be a source of encouragement and healing for any of us who have lost a child. It is also our hope that for those who have not been able to grieve, that they be able to grieve in a healthy way that will be support supported by all who love them. Nursery of Heaven is a book that chronicles the stories of parents who lost children to miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant loss. I am honored to have my story about the loss of my son, Michael, in this book. Um, please consider purchasing a copy for yourselves or for someone who has gone through the loss of a child. And you can purchase the book at the table in the back for 1050. So right now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. So my plan is to introduce all three in the order that they will be speaking so it's a smoother flow, so to speak. So our first uh, presenter will be uh, Patrick O'Hearn, and he is a husband and father of three children, two of whom are in heaven. His family roots are in Ohio, as his parents and many relatives live here. He currently resides in Raleigh, North Carolina. He works in sales, but hopes someday to become a full-time writer. This past October, he co-authored his first book, Nursery of Heaven, and has several others in the works. He is a practicing Catholic 
and is committed to the pro-life movement. Sue McIlroy, who has been married to her husband Bob for 25 years, is from Munson, Ohio, and attends St. Helens Catholic Church in Newberry. She and her husband have 11 children, two of whom are six-year-old twins that they just officially adopted this past December 17th from the Hamilton County foster care system. Their ninth child, Sam, who is in heaven, died through the tragedy of miscarriage. Susan, a former elementary Catholic school teacher, stays at home with her children whom she homeschools. The story of her miscarriage is featured in the chapter, His Name is Sam, in the book Nursery of Heaven by Cassie Edwards and Patrick O'Hearn. And Jackie Chichella is a mother of six boys or who are here on earth and a little saint in heaven. She lives in Geauga County with her husband, Jeff, her sons, and a black lab named Jeff. Jackie is a data architect by day who homeschools her school-aged sons with the help of her awesome father, Denver Sully. And Jackie is passionate about helping moms and families who have experienced a miscarriage in any way she can. So please um, give our panelists a warm welcome. We're going to begin with Patrick, followed by Sue, and then Jackie. Thank you. Two things I dreaded the most growing up were writing and public speaking. <laughs> Truly, nothing is impossible for God. I want to thank Jackie Fetzko for inviting me. I want to thank God for the gift of my life, along with my two beautiful parents, Steve and Maureen, who are present today. From an early age, my parents taught me the necessity of upholding every person's dignity, from the unborn child to the elderly. I would also like to thank each one of you for committing yourself to the greatest mission of our time, which is ending abortion and living the gospel of life. When my aunt Annette Vidmar was born over 50 years ago, the doctors told my grandparents to put her in an institution. Had she been born today, the doctors would have pushed an abortion. You see, my aunt Nettie was born with Down syndrome. Tragically, nine out of 10 people with Down syndrome are aborted today. My Aunt Nettie is one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate about the pro-life movement. Nettie's hugs, her joy, and her simplicity have showed me what it means to be a child of God. Surprisingly, at the age of 54, Nettie has fewer gray hairs than me, and I'm nearly 20 years younger. I believe Nettie lives forever in the present moment and does not worry about the past or the future. What an example for all of us. I have always been pro-life, but I have not always been passionately pro-life. I remember a time in my Catholic high school when I overheard a male classmate insist that a pregnant peer should have an abortion. He said it in a very mean way, as if her baby was some leech, instead of an immortal soul willed by God from all eternity. Regrettably, I never confronted my male classmate, but I did tell the girl I hope she keeps her child with a smile, she said, of course. All you young people, it is never too early to defend the unborn child. God is counting on you. We cannot remain silent when a fourth of our generation has been wiped out. In college, the Holy Spirit led me to sidewalk counsel at abortion clinics. I couldn't recite all the biological facts of pregnancy, but what I could do is be a loving presence and a voice for the unborn child. Rather than condemn these parents, I prayed for them. The line I use most often, and still use today, is you are a beautiful mother. Rocks were thrown at me, security guards and fathers insulted me and threatened me. They told me this was a woman's choice, and that as a man I had no say. One winter afternoon in 2010, I came face to face with the notorious founder of partial birth abortion, Dr. Martin Roddick. I know many of us have prayed for his conversion. As he rolled down his window in his Mercedes Benz, he told me in a very accosting tone, do something better with your life. I could see the anger and hatred in his eyes. I paused for a second, knowing that in my heart, this was the best use of my time, 
and said words only the Holy Spirit could put on my tongue. God loves you. He went inside to kill babies. Meanwhile, I prayed for God to spare them. I will also never forget the time a woman came by to thank me for praying outside preterm abortion clinic in Cleveland, where I know many of you pray there today. She said that 20 years ago, she was about to abort her child, but the presence of a priest praying outside made her turn away. The priest never said a word. In fact, she ended up having twins. Never doubt your prayers and witness. So moving on to today's topic of today's winter life event, of miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant loss. My first encounter with miscarriage happened after college when sadly two of my cousins suffered miscarriages. I told them I was sorry and prayed for them. I regret not sending them a little memorial gift or asking them how they were doing months or even years later. It was not until I got married and we lost our own children that I realized the depths of this suffering. We really cannot know someone else's cross until we ourselves have carried the same cross. Having lost two children from miscarriage in a span of 14 months, my wife and I experienced the greatest trial of our married life thus far. On a side note, most miscarriages take place in the first trimester, which is the same time that most abortions occur. Hence, both parents grieve a loss at the exact same stage of life. Further, furthermore, many parents who have lost a child through abortion, miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant loss grieve in a similar way. Though the years pass, many never forget the day of their child's death or their due date. Yes, losing a child is one of the most difficult sufferings any parent will experience in this life, whether we were able to hold them or not. It is a reason couples who miscarry have a higher rate of divorce than those who don't. The pain is real. I long for my wife to find joy again after nights of crying in bed. I long for her belly to be pregnant again. And I still long and pray for our oldest son, Jude, to have a sibling to play with. Seeing him play by himself rather than chasing his siblings always rips me to the core. As men, we want to fix things, especially our wife's problems. But when you lose a child, only God can mend a broken heart. Unfortunately, many of our relatives, friends, co-workers, and even pastors do not know what to say. So they say nothing. When they remain silent, they act as if our child didn't matter, or even worse, as if they never existed. I believe this is a symptom of the culture of death a culture which no longer sees eye to eye with God. God does not measure our dignity by the number of weeks we live, and neither should we. Our children created by God at conception are fully alive. They are waiting to leave their footprint on our world as their little feet grow moment by moment in their mother's wombs. To all of you here who have experienced this indifference, I want to tell you that I'm sorry for your loss. I suffer with you. And above all, our Lord and his mother suffer with you. In my own search for meaning in my suffering, I felt God nudging me to turn my pain into gain. I knew other couples who were not fortunate to have even one living child. I felt him saying, Patrick, help others carry their crosses. Out of my suffering and through the prayers of my two children in heaven, God put on my heart the book Nursery of Heaven which I co-authored with Cassie Everett, who had five miscarriages. I am so grateful that Jackie Fetzko and Sue McElroy shared their powerful stories in this book. This book would not have been possible without their stories and support. My beautiful wife Amanda also shared her story. Rather than go into detail about the book, I would encourage you to check it out and pass it on to those who are affected by child loss. Every story is unique, every obstacle is different, but we all share the same cross, the loss of a child, the supreme fruit of our marriage. I believe the nursery of heaven is like a symphony where each story from the saints and today's couples resemble a different instrument
which glorifies God in one beautiful hymn of suffering, healing, and hope. Thanks be to God, many in our culture are tired of believing Satan's lies, not only concerning abortion, but also with miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant loss. Child loss, especially miscarriage, has impacted the likes of country music star Carrie Underwood, NFL quarterback Nick Foles, to many of us gathered here today. Your very presence today speaks to truth, that life has dignity, and that we ought to properly grieve our children who have died, both seen and unseen. Last month, the world mourned the loss of former NBA star Kobe Bryant. Not taking away anything from Kobe, I think how sad that the children we have lost and those aborted never get an opportunity to be missed. We too must mourn them. On a personal level, I was made aware last month that my recently departed grandmother, my dad's mother, had suffered a stillbirth in the 1950s. It was a boy, my uncle. My grandmother told only a few people. After being induced into labor, the child was quickly taken away. My grandmother likely never got to hold her son. My uncle has no name. He has no tombstone. It was like he never existed. And my grandmother suffered from depression after losing her child, which I think is normal for such a dramatic event. I don't know how to explain this to you, but when I look at my aunts and uncles, I always felt someone was missing. Now I know why. Fortunately, many hospitals today allow grieving parents some time to hold their departed child, but the time is never enough. Like my grandmother, I realize that many of us who have had a miscarriage, stillbirth, or infant loss never have closure. And let's face it, there really is never closure when you lose a child. With a miscarriage, many of us never saw an ultrasound or even an intact body. We are left wondering. The pain just won't go away. For some people, they are blessed to get pregnant immediately. But for many of us, this might be our last child. Every child is a gift and not a right. As I mentioned in our book, my wife and I found it extremely difficult when most of our friends were having their third and fourth child. And we would be grateful for one more living child. It also didn't help when pro-life people would innocently, innocently ask us, is this all your children? It's about time for another one. Seeing a pregnant woman used to be the most glorious sight for my wife and me, but for now it is bittersweet because it also reminds us of what we have lost. We rejoice in this new life, this undeserved gift from God, but we also pray for the grace to surrender to his will. Every Thursday before work, I visit my two children's graves, Thomas John and Angelica Rose. Thomas would have been two this week, which is very difficult. It's, it's my wife, and she's at home in uh, North Carolina, and it's, just, it's been a very, very tough week for her. Um, so. And Angelica would have been one in April. Our precious children are buried side by side. I ask them to pray for their daddy, mommy, and brother. I ask them to intercede that mommy might be healed if God wills and to conceive another child whom we can hold. I sense them all around me. I truly miss them, and I speak to them sometimes as I'm driving home from work. I take consolation that they have each other, and I hope you too will welcome your little ones into your life. Just because you cannot see them does not mean that they are not near. Never forget them and prayerfully name them if you haven't yet. I would like to conclude my testimony by mentioning a gentleman I know, Sean Sager, who is one of the greatest pro-life warriors of our time from neighboring Indiana. Sean devoted his life to prison, pro-life, and homeless ministry, in addition to lecturing at Mass. He spent at least one summer walking across the United States praying at abortion clinics via the Crossroads pro-life group. I met him in college where he would faithfully attend 6.30 a.m. Mass every Saturday and then drive his peers to Pittsburgh to pray at the abortion clinic for hours. Sadly, Sean died at the age of 33 last month from a blood clot in his lungs and was buried on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. 
Both his age, 33, which is the same age as our Lord, died, and his burial date are not a coincidence. Sean always dreamt of having children, but as my friend Bill texted me after Sean died, in quotes, I think the Lord wanted him to come watch the kids in the nursery of heaven. What many people don't know is that Sean had high-functioning autism. Sean's heroic pro-life witness shows us that we must never put limits on what God can do in our life. God wants to do amazing things in our lives. He wants to work through our defects and weaknesses, even the very things we dread or fear the most, as St. Paul said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Like Sean, God has a mission for each one of us to build up the culture of life in our own way. With the Holy Spirit inside us and an army in heaven, especially our little ones in the nursery of heaven, praying for us, let us recommit ourselves to ending abortion and helping those who suffer from miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant loss, and every person in most need. Whatever time we have left in this world, let us do something beautiful for God, because we never know when God will call us home. One of the most beautiful lines written in the nursery of heaven is from my friend Peter, who describes the insensitivity of his doctor during the loss of his first child. Peter writes, like many people then and later, he simply thought that we wanted a child and didn't get one, but we knew we had a child and lost it. Contrary to our world, and even what we believe at times, our children are not lost forever. Rather, they have been found forever in heaven in the arms of Jesus and his blessed mother in the nursery of heaven. I pray that the hope of seeing God face to face and being reunited with our little ones as they run towards us saying, Daddy and Mommy, we miss you, strengthens us when our crosses and sorrows seem unbearable. All you little holy men and women in the nursery of heaven, Pray for us. God love you. through your blog, we're showing others that our babies do matter, that they do count, that they exist, and are loved by God. So thank you. Um, we could start with an Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, O Lord God, amen. Thank you. Um, my name is Sue McRoy, and I'm blessed to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, last year in January, my husband and I, usually on Saturdays, we watch TV, like, in the morning. And we watch, and usually when we watch TV, it's with my husband just flipping through the channels, drives me crazy. <laughs> so anyways, last January, um, he was flipping through the channels, and all of a sudden he stopped at this movie that caught my attention. And in the movie was um, the actress Julianne Moore, and her character she was playing was Telly. And in this movie, she was, she was a mom who was frantically searching for her son. She couldn't find her son. She was asking all these people, do you know where my son is? Do you remember him? Everyone thought she was crazy, and they responded to her, who are you talking about? We don't know him. 
What's wrong with you? He never existed. In the last few minutes of the movie, <clears throat> Telly encounters a strange man who has all the answers to her questions. However, this man, his goal is to erase all the memories of her child. Um, so he's pretty success, successful, and he only has one more memory that he needs to erase, and that's the day that her child was born. Um, and he succeeds in erasing her memory, and then he says to her, to prove that he succeeded, he says, that boy, what was his name? <coughs> Telly responds, what boy? Well, at this moment, she starts to remember all the memories of her pregnancy, of when her child was in her womb, and she starts to rub her belly. So if you could imagine all her memories from the day of the birth forward, she didn't remember, but she remembered all the memories of her baby in the womb. <coughs> um, she rubs her belly and says, I have life inside me. I have life. I have a child. I have a son. I have a son. His name is Sam. Well, when, this, when I heard those words, those words like hit me to the core. And all of a sudden, I started crying tears that I didn't even know I had. Because a year and a half earlier, my husband and I had lost our ninth child through miscarriage. And we named him Sam. So I feel like that was a God, a God moment. But um, anyways, I was so shocked by these words, but it, the tears and the pain was just coming in. And I had buried the pain from my, I don't even think I ever processed the pain from my miscarriage. It was just something that was deep within me. Because in our culture, we don't allow mothers to grieve the loss of their miscarriages. And a lot of mothers feel that they don't have the right. When I lost our baby, I felt like I didn't even have the right to mourn my baby. Um, but when I asked my husband, what was, what's this movie, what's it called? He said the name of the movie was The Forgotten, which caused me to cry even more. The Forgotten. Because um, I felt that my son was forgotten, and I felt that I was forgotten, and our pain was forgotten. Because of this miscarriage, Bob, my husband, Sam, and I were kind of like automatically made members of this club, which I call the Forgotten and the Forsaken. <clears throat> the Forgotten and the Forsaken is a club with many moms, many dads, and babies that I never knew existed until we lost our baby. And all these people are mourning in silence, and they're living a silent sorrow. Um, our story began, so we had um, eight children, and I was 47 years old. And so I thought that part of my life was over. <laughs> so that I thought that was on the shelf and done with. So when we found out that we were pregnant with our ninth child, we found out on Mother's Day 2017, I thought it was going crazy. I really thought it was in menopause, but I was shocked to see, or what, what do you call it? The, <laughs> the pregnancy test. I was like, there's something wrong with this test. But anyways, um, we were pregnant, and so I went to my doctor right away because my only other pregnancies were high-risk pregnancies, and I'm, when I get pregnant, I have to make sure that it's not a topic I'm in danger of hemorrhaging. So when we went, the doctor did confirm that I was pregnant, but he first said that he, couldn't, he found the sack, but he couldn't find the baby in the sack. So he called it a pregnancy of unknown location, which he told us that we were going to have to come in for another ultrasound um, a few days later. Um, when the technician did the ultrasound, like, it was a couple days later, she eventually found the baby and she found the heartbeat. So we got to hear our baby's heartbeat at a very young age. And um, I just have to tell you, when you were like, I never heard of pregnancy of unknown location. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But it makes you sound like, what? <laughs> what is this? There's a baby, but no one knows where the baby is. So, but to hear the baby's heartbeat, was the most beautiful sound that I ever heard because I just wanted to know that my baby was okay. And so then we, when we heard our baby's heartbeat, I looked over to my husband and he had tears in his eyes because we thought that we weren't gonna be able to have that baby. And he cried and he said, Sue, this baby is special. He's going to do something to change the world. 
which I totally believed him, so I thought our baby's going to live. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we had to do more ultrasounds, but all of our ultrasounds, we kept on seeing the baby grow. And, our, you know, these are ultrasounds are very tiny babies, but we saw that our baby grow. We got to see the heartbeat. Um, and the doctor kept on saying, you know, I can't believe this is happening. I think everything's going to be okay. However, uh, weeks, about four or five weeks passed, we were coming home from North Carolina in the Outer Banks. And six, it's a 12 hour trip. Six hours on the way home, I started bleeding. <coughs> um, and I started having contractions. So then I was like, I, I never had a miscarriage. So, but I heard about miscarriages and I was like upset going through the mountains. I was like, I'm losing my baby, I'm not even home. So it was very painful and I was very panicked. So I get crazy <laughs> when I'm nervous and I'm crying. My husband's like, I'm like, you gotta get home. He's like, I can't drive any faster, you know. But <clears throat> I just remember being in the mountains though. And then you know the prayer in scripture that says, if you have the faith to see, if you have the faith. <laughs> If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. I remember going through, thank you. I remember going through those mountains, and I remember looking at those mountains, and I remember thinking, those mountains look so small to me. I know that God, if he wills it, can save my baby. And I was convinced of that. So I'm like, Jesus, I believe. I know you can move these mountains. I know you can save my baby. And I thought that he would, but he has other plans, and he decided, no, that's not my will for you, which was very hard for me to accept. But when we got home from our trip, the bleeding and the pain started increasing. And my um, sister, who I haven't talked to in a while, she happened to call me, and she <coughs> heard the pain. She heard the, I was in labor. I, I never knew that when you had a miscarriage that you go through the same process as someone who has a baby. You go through the labor process and you have contractions. So my sister called, she's like, Sue, I think you're losing your baby. And what's really amazing about the fact that she called is that I hadn't talked to her in a while, but she herself had five miscarriages. And what I feel horrible about, like Patrick said in his story, you don't really know the suffering of someone else until you go through it. You're not able to help someone carry their cross until you go through it. I, in all those years, was indifferent to my sister's miscarriages. She had five. She lost five babies. But she was on the phone with me, trying to help me carry my cross. <coughs> um, as the night progressed, things calmed down. And in the morning, she called me. She, I was much more calm. Uh, during the night, as I was losing more blood, I saved everything because I wasn't sure what was happening. And I wanted to take, I did not want my baby to go down the toilet, but I wasn't sure what to look for. So I saved everything. In the morning, um, my sister called me and she says, I think you lost the baby. She told me I need to call the doctor right away. So I called the doctor right away and um, he told me to come in for an ultrasound. But I was convinced that my baby was in the container that I had. So when they did the ultrasound up on the screen, we found our baby. And I was shocked. I was shocked because in those few weeks that I had seen him last, he was huge. I was admiring how beautiful he was. He got so big, his, you could see the formation of Sam. So I was admiring him. I had no clue that he was lifeless. And then I remember my doctor saying to me, I'm sorry, Susan, your baby has no higher heartbeat. And it was in that moment that I just like lost all breath. Um, there's like no words to say. But I'm grateful that I got to see my baby one last time. But he had died. So at that point, because I had high-risk pregnancies and I was already lost a lot of blood that my doctor was worried about, he wanted me to do a DNC right away. But I myself did not want to do that because my mom was very pro-life. We picketed. My entire life is about being pro-life. 
And so in my head, I was like, I can't do this DNC because I felt like I would be mutilating my baby. I felt like I would be having an abortion. Even though I saw that the baby was dead, you still had that hope that the heartbeat's going to start again. <laughs> and I didn't want to be responsible for mutilating my baby. But then my doctor, my pastor, Father Jay, and uh, my husband said, you have eight beautiful children to live for. You need to have this operation. So we agreed. All right, agreed. Um, so this DNC was going to be two, out, two days later. And... So during those two days, I was thinking, my first thing I was thinking of, I had the example of Jackie Chakilla. She had buried her baby, who she lost through Jansen, who she lost through miscarriage years before, which was a huge witness for me. And I also had another friend, Jennifer, who also buried her baby. Because of their example, I knew that I could bury my baby. But since I was going through a DNC, I knew it would be hard because depending on the age of your baby, the hospital has rights to, they call, they call it baby, we call it baby, they call it specimen byproducts, um, products of conception. So I did research and I found out um, in the state of Ohio, in about 2015, so a couple years before I even lost my baby, some wonderful people passed a law in Ohio that says that anyone who loses a baby underneath 20 weeks has the rights to they call products to their baby, but the hospital calls it specimen, you know, they call it the products of consumption. So anyways, the name of the bill is Stakel, I lost my place. Ohio Law, Senate Bill 175 is called the Grieving Parents Act. So if anyone who loses a baby through miscarriage that is under 20 weeks, they have the right to go to the when they're in the hospital and they're having a DNC. If they quote that law to the hospital, the hospital has to give them their baby back. And you have to fill out a form. So when I went to the hospital, I asked for that form that I needed to fill out. But a lot of them, most of the medical personnel had no clue what I was talking about because most of our hospitals and medical and our doctors don't know about this law. So they went crazy trying to find it, but then they, when they finally find, found it, a nurse came to me and said, I have that paper for, your two, for the release of your specimen. And I was like, I had no clue what you're, I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, your specimen. And it hit me, I'm like, are you talking about my baby? And then in that moment, she could see the horror come over her face. She's like, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm talking about your baby. So is she, I'm gonna fill out this form. This is the form right here. And it's called um, Release of Liability and Receipt of Specimen or Device. I have requested that the specimen or device provided to me by the Cleveland Clinic Foundation should be released. And then throughout this whole paper, they re constantly refer to the baby as specimen or device. So I myself was like, I cannot refer to my baby as a specimen. So I crossed out the word specimen and I wrote in little tiny words, baby. And so the nurse saw me what I was doing, because I'm always afraid to break laws. So you know what people yell at me? So that's why I wrote, like, little baby. She saw what I was doing. I, I think through her remorse, she felt so bad, and she crossed it at, that out. And she wrote, baby. She wrote, baby, really in capital letters. And to me, that was like such a huge gift, because she saw that she pronounced dignity on my son. She then continued to say that she would fight for my baby to make sure that I would get my baby back after the procedure was done. Um, <clears throat> when the procedure was done, they told me that I should be able to receive my baby back in 24 to 48 hours after I went to pathology. I was hoping I could have the baby right back right away because Patrick mentioned this too. When you, when you lose a baby to miscarriage, you never have the chance to hold your baby and the desire to hold your baby is so profound. Um, and all I wanted to do was just hold my baby, but I had to wait. <laughs> so after 48 hours, when I was supposed to receive my baby back, um, they didn't know where my baby was. So they're like, you need to call next week. So I called the week later. <laughs> and they're like, we don't know where he is. So I, I, about two or three weeks of this, I constantly called 
the, doc, the doctors, the hospital, like every department in the Cleveland Clinic, and no one knew where my baby was, which was became another trauma for me. I actually felt like how Mary Magdalene is, you know, when she was looking for Jesus, I felt like I was leaving her panic. And I'm like, all I want is my baby back so I could bury my baby. And I had this huge fear of this teenage boy being in a basement somewhere, chomping on his gum, and just throwing my baby in the garbage. Because I had no clue. I had no control over the situation. <laughs> I was angry with God. I know I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> but I said to Jesus, I'm like, I don't understand this. First I lose my baby. I just want to bury my baby. Can't you bring him home to me? And when I had called the hospital that final time, they said it's probably going to be another two weeks. And we don't think it's in Hillcrest anymore. We think we shift it down to main campus. So it's going to take a few weeks. So I was like hysterical and I started crying. Well, and I yelled at God. <laughs> but God is loving and merciful. He sent my friend Jackie. Jackie happened to call me in those moments that I was hysterical. And I told her what happened. She called her dad, Denver. Um, I'm so grateful to you guys. So Denver called me and he said, see, I can help you. I'm going to call my friend. He's a lawyer, attorney Matt Lynch. And he's like, we'll get this done for you. And I was like, oh, no, lawyers. This is, like, scary. <laughs> I don't like to cause ruffle. Like, I don't want to cause any problems. And Denver's like, Sue, this is important. You have the right to your baby back. So I agreed, and Denver called Matt Lynch. And Matt Lynch, when he called me, and I don't know if you know Matt Lynch, he's, he was a lawyer, now he's a judge, and he's incredibly pro-life too. He told me to call up a funeral home. So I ended up calling Bob Dijon from Dijon Funeral Homes. And I don't know him, he didn't know me. <laughs> and he's, I felt like I was this crazy lady. I'm like, I lost my baby, they told me to call you, I can't find him. And he's like, and I told him what happened. He, he was mad when he found out it was like three or four weeks and I had to receive my baby back. And he said, you should have had your baby back within 24 to 48 hours. You call that hospital back and you demand him back. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know how to do that. I need help. And he's Italian. So in a very thick Italian voice, he's like, I got to find out what he said. <laughs> Out, you know, Italian. So I felt like he was Sylvester Stallone, like Rambo, like, I'll help you. I'll get your baby back. And I was like, <laughs> and I, I was like, so, I believed him. I was like, oh, I don't want to be that hospital now. So <laughs> he, God was so good that he brought me three beautiful men, Denver, Matt Lynch, and Bob Dijon. They never knew me, but the other two didn't know me. And I just think it's incredible that th these three men worked together to help me find my baby back. That they saw the importance of the dignity of my baby that no one would ever see or hold. But they felt, they just saw the beauty of his life, even though no one in the world did. And they fought and they got my baby back. And I will always be grateful to you, Denver. Always. So because I got my baby back, I was able to bury Sam. Um, he's now at All Souls Cemetery. And what's nice about All Souls is they provide free burial for children five and under. And we got a free headstone. And Bob Dijon didn't charge me any money. Um, he, he, we did a funeral service at Graveside and, um, at Matt Lynch. So I, I think all of them. But after we, and Father Jay, we did a we did a service, and he, he spoke. Anyways, um, I know a lot of people don't have that opportunity to bury their baby, and it's not their fault because we don't communicate to others that you can bury your baby, and that there's the Catholic Cemetery Association is willing to help, and good Catholic funeral directors like Bob Dijon is willing to help, and that there's a law written for us that says you could get your baby back if you go in for a DNC. And I feel like we in the pro-life movement needs to get that word out so that other people know that they could bury their baby. Um, because I was so interested in trying to get my baby back, I never processed that I lost my baby or had a miscarriage. And these two terms, miscarriage and lose, lost my baby, somehow lessen 
the reality that my child died. It's not like I lost a tooth, I didn't lose a sack, I lost a child. Um, at the same time that I lost my child, there was a, another woman who lost her child through a tragic car accident. And I, all of us in the parish felt horrible for her. And during that time, because it was the same week that I lost my baby, I felt horrible because I felt like I had no right to mourn my baby when this mother lost her child. And so I told myself, I'm not allowed to mourn. But inside, my body was screaming, you do have a right to mourn. You lost your baby. Your, ch your child counts just as much as her child, not taken away from her tragedy. But when we have babies within our womb, even though no one sees them, they are children that God granted us. They are souls. <laughs> um, I was not prepared for the silence of others. You know, when we go to funerals, we usually offer our condolences. But when you have a miscarriage, people are silent. And that silence is very painful. Um, I just remember wishing that people would, like my family and friends who knew I lost a baby never said a word. Not all of them, but some of them. But I just wanted so much for someone just to say, how are you doing? I'm so sorry for your loss. Because my baby counts too. Um, and then in addition to the silence and the indifference that I suffered, that most people suffer through mis all people suffer through miscarriage, there's also comments that you hear. So one of the comments I heard was, you should be grateful you have eight children. And that really hurt. Just because I had eight children, I was grateful for the eight children I have. I'm incredibly blessed. But I'm sad for the ninth that I lost. He counts too. I never, never was ungrateful for my other children. I was just sad for the one that I never got to hold. Another comment that you'll hear is, how many weeks was your baby? I hate that question, but it's a question that I used to always do when people lost their babies. I would say, oh, how many weeks? And the reason why I hate this question is because it's, it quantifies your child in the eyes of the world. It quantifies if they have, a, if they have dignity. And we, as pro-lifers, tend to do things to quantify our children, too. We don't mean it. But whenever I do answer that question, um, my, my child, I love, at the DNC where they happened at 10 weeks, my child died at eight weeks. Whenever someone says, how many weeks was your child? And I answer, 99% of the time, you, I see the face like, oh, that's it? That's all? Who cares? If we believe that our, we say in our church every week, we believe that it's life from the moment of conception to the time of natural death. We believe that it's a baby, dignity of God with the soul. What? It doesn't, in that moment, it's a child. So why would we say to a mother who lost her child at five weeks or six weeks, like, oh, that's all? We're all guilty of it. I was guilty of it. I'm sorry for all the people that I hurt because I didn't count their babies. Their babies were true children. We never got to hold them. They're in heaven. But those moms who lost their babies at five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 20 weeks, they're all suffering the same. They all want to hold their children. The third comment which kind of really surprises me, is you should be grateful. There was probably something wrong with your baby. Count your blessings. And a lot of times I got this from pro-lifers and strong Catholics, which also surprised me. Because I find it ironic that we're on the streets at preterm, which is wonderful that we are. But if we are saying that a mother who's considering to have an abortion, if you find out that her baby has Down syndrome, and you try to counsel her to say that baby has dignity, why would you then say to a mother who lost her baby through miscarriage, who might have had like a chromosomal abnormality or might have had Down syndrome, why would you say, oh, count your blessings? You wouldn't want to take care of that child. How could we say both things? It's double speak. When a mother loses her child, 
She doesn't care if he had chromosomal abnormalities. I would have loved to take care of my Sam. So when people said, you should be grateful, there was probably something wrong with it, that hurts me to the core. We have to watch what we say to people who lose their babies from miscarriage. It's double speak. Um, so I struggled with the comments, and I struggled with the indifference, so I had a lot of anger. So I needed to go somewhere, so I went to the confessional. A lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> the priests were wonderful, and in the confessional I found healing. And in the confessional the priest said, Sue, not only do you have a right to mourn your baby, you have an obligation to mourn your baby. And if I, for anyone who's lost their baby, don't feel that it's wrong for you to mourn. You have an obligation to. Because you're a mother, you love your child. Um, another priest told me that Sam's life mattered. He, and that meant, just to hear a priest said, Sue, your son's life mattered. He had dignity. No matter how hidden his life was, and no matter how young he was. My desire to have people acknowledge that I lost a child, my determination to find his body, my need to have permission to mourn Sam was rooted in my quest to prove that Sam's life mattered, that he was real, that he had dignity, and that he was a person. One day, I received a sympathy card from a lady who I didn't even know who went to my church. She, in the card, she said, I'm sorry for the loss of your son, Samuel Mary. That was one of the best gifts I ever got, because in the card, she acknowledged his name, and she acknowledged that he was a person. I never realized the power and the beauty of a name. Our name shows personhood and dignity of life, a life worth remembering. At our church, every Good Friday, our pastor reads all the people who passed away during that year. On April 2, 2018, on Good Friday, my pastor read Samuel Mary McElroy, along with the other children, along with the other names of the deceased members of our church family. Hearing Sam's name proclaimed brought me so much peace and joy. It was one of the best days. Like, I, Good Friday is such a solemn occasion, but to hear his name proclaimed, that my pastor said, I'm like, he's real. And he's counts just as much as all these other people's names that were just read. And then I heard God say to me in those moments that I heard um, Father Jay say Sam's name, I heard the Lord say to me, Sam matters. His life counts just as these others do. I have called Sam by name. He is mine. When God created Sam and put him in my womb, he called him by name. Sam's purpose and mission in life was hidden, but it was no less important than someone who lived to be a hundred. God called Sam home because he did what he was supposed to do although he was unknown. Although his life and worth are quantified by the standards of this world, Sam's life is priceless and has dignity in the eyes of God. Although no one ever got to hear him cry, see him smile, or feel his embrace, his life forever impacts the life of his mom and the life of his family. One day when I was crying, my youngest daughter, you know, hid somewhere, she's here. She's over there. <laughs> You know, one day when I was crying, Hannah asked me, Mom, why are you sad? And I said, Mom, I said, today is Sam's due date. I'm sad because he didn't have a chance to be born. And Hannah looked at me and she confidently exclaimed, Mom, Sam was born. Sam was born into heaven. That was, she was six years old at the time. Like, what wisdom? My son, Sam, was born. He was born into heaven. When people have babies, we all see, get the birth announcements. Um, but when you have a baby through miscarriage, you never get to announce his name. You never get to do those birth announcements. I am grateful to God for the life of Sam. Sam's life was silent yet powerful. His life stretched my heart and set my eyes on heaven. I am grateful that the Lord chose me to be Sam's mom. 
If God gave me the choice between experiencing his short life through the agony of miscarriage and not having him at all, I would choose Sam. Sam is alive. He exists. He is in heaven resting in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Sam is not forgotten. As Telly professed, the life of her son in the movie is forgotten. Today, I announced the birth of my son who was born into heaven. I had life inside me. I had life. I have a child. I have a son. I have a son. He is called by name, and his name is Sam. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jackie Chikala, and I'm the mother of six boys and a little saint in heaven named Jansen Benedict. My husband and I were always open to new life. We never planned to have children. We just accepted them as they came. My plan was I was going to have two boys and two girls, but I have six boys, so <laughs> see how that works out. When we found out I was pregnant again, we were excited by the prospect of adding a new member to our family. Sadly, though, our joy was short-lived when an ultrasound revealed that Jansen didn't have a heartbeat. Our sweet little baby, who looked so perfectly formed on that screen, was not with us anymore. He had passed away in my womb. I was in shock and things, as things moved quickly, and I was ushered into an office where arrangements were made for a D&E. What came next was a blur, except that I heard the voices of my doctor and her nurse as they kept making references to the products of conception. I hate those words more than anything. But I didn't really process what happened in that moment. I blindly filled out forms and signed forms, and I listened without hearing as my doctor told me the details of the procedure that was going to save my life. A few minutes ago, we were laughing and joking about adding another one to my brew, as she liked to call them. And now, I was being told that this child within my womb was something dangerous and could kill me. After she explain, finished explaining this procedure that I was going to go through, with my head spinning, I was shown a back door out of the office so that I didn't have to walk that long mile through the waiting room filled with happy moms waiting for the arrival of the little ones. I actually did something horrible after that. My poor husband wasn't with me at that appointment, and I went out and got in the car, and I called him, and when he answered the phone, I said, the baby's dead. That's where my head was in that moment. I didn't even think how to soften that blow for my poor husband because I wasn't in my right mind. The rest of the day was a complete whirlwind of tears and hugs and trying to process the news. Our precious little baby was gone. I struggled with the details of that procedure that was awaiting me, and especially with the fact that the hospital was not going to return my child's remains to me because my child was less than 20 weeks old and this was in 2010, before that law was passed. I could not shake the feeling that there had to be a better way. Our precious baby was gone, and just because he was a couple weeks shy of the magic 20 weeks, he wasn't human enough to qualify for a dignified burial. The hospital considered him nothing more than medical waste, something that they were going to test and throw away. I couldn't live with that outcome with my sweet little baby. My baby was a person, a child of God who deserved to be treated with dignity and respect. All of this happened before a long July 4th weekend that gave me a lot of time to pray about our situation. Before the weekend was over, I decided that I wasn't going to go through with the d &E. I couldn't. I would deliver Jansen at home if at all possible so that we could give him a proper burial. My doctor was furious with me. She would call me every few days to tell me about all the horrible things that were going to happen to me if I didn't come in and have this procedure. However, I was feeling great physically, and I told her that I had to do this to preserve the dignity of my child. And now she was the one whose head was spinning. She couldn't wrap her head around my desire to bury my baby. She couldn't comprehend why burying my child was so important to me. While we were waiting for Jansen to deliver naturally, we continued doing things that we always did. 
And one of the things that I did at the time was attend First Saturday Mass at Benedictine Abbey, followed by the recitation of the rosary outside of preacher. As I walked and I prayed the rosary that day, I was struck by two things. First, it hit me that here I was praying desperately that the baby inside my womb would magically come back to life, that he would have a heartbeat, that the ultrasound was wrong, and that we would be adding to our family. The second thing that struck me was that, the abor that abortion has died. And as I was wishing my baby was going to come back to life, woman after woman, it was a very busy Saturday, was going into preterm to end the life of their babies. The second thing that struck me was that abortion has desensitized our culture to the point that recognizing that a child lost through miscarriage or stillbirth or other forms of infant loss would ruin the abortion myth that the child in the womb is just some kind of clump of cells. I mold over the poor pro-abortion talking, talking points that a wanted child is a baby, but an unwanted child is a clump of cells. Well, I wanted my baby. I desperately wanted my baby. And my baby wasn't a clump of cells. I wanted my baby, and yet as soon as we learned that Jansen passed away, immediately everyone stopped referring to him as a baby. He was, a, he was the products of conception, the contents of the uterus, and as Sue said, the specimen. Yes, Jansen was the product of a conception. The product of that conception was a baby, a baby who was very much wanted. Thanks to the abortion industry, the medical profession and society at large tends to ignore the fact that women and families who have lost a child to miscarriage or stillbirth are mourning a real person whom they loved and looked forward to meeting one day. And so they don't realize that this language that they're using is extremely hurtful. As the days went by and I continued to ponder that second thought, why do we just accept the fact that a baby lost before 20 weeks becomes the property for the hospital to research and dispose as medical waste? Why aren't medical personnel more compassionate? I know there are some that are, but when you're going through this trauma, even the kindest of people don't seem that kind, especially when they're using these desensitized terms. In my case, Jansen was referred to as a baby until we learned that he had passed away why is he dehumanized like that? Why do we think that someone who's experienced a miscarriage will move on and get over it? It's not like they ever held the baby anyway. Why do we ignore the fact that families who've lost a child through miscarriage need closure just like anyone else who's experienced a loss? If we believe that life begins at conception and that the child in the womb is a precious child of God, then we need to rise above these societal pressures and this lingo that dehumanizes these children lost to miscarriage and stillbirth. Furthermore, I believe that miscarriage and stillbirth are considered taboo even in this day. People don't like to hear, hear people talk about these things in polite company. We tend to shy away from people when we hear that they've experienced this type of loss because we just don't know what to say. It's hard to find the right words. It's easier just to ignore the person or to offer them platitudes. And so in addition to some of the things that Sue mentioned, here are some of my favorites that I encountered at work and other places. It's really no big deal. Everybody has those. I've had one. And I want to say, well, it's a big deal to me. Or there's another one. <coughs> you can have more. Really? How do you know? Because I will tell you, it never happened again. It's not like you ever held it. Yes, I did. I held him next to my heart for 16 weeks. And then the one that I hate the most is it's God's will. Because yes, I know it's God's will. I understand that and I accept it. But it doesn't make it any less painful. The best thing to say to someone who's lost a child, their precious little baby, is simply, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, is there anything that I can do for you? I delivered Jansen at home on a Sunday morning. My husband and I had a chance to see our perfectly formed little baby who was so tiny and so precious. We cried as we held our little darling in my hands and we marveled at how perfectly formed he was. He actually looked just like all our other babies did in miniature form. 
little hands and little feet, tiny little eyes. He truly was wonderfully made. Our local funeral home was incredibly kind and understanding, and the funeral director shared that he and his wife had experienced a miscarriage, and he made me feel like he truly understood and validated our grief. Also, Cemetery was also extremely caring and so generous, providing us with a burial plot and headstone free of charge in a special section of the cemetery set aside for little bear babies. We opted for a graveside service with our family instead of a funeral mass. Our parish priest brought us all to tears as he spoke to the humanity of our sweet little baby. He never referred to some clump of cells or the products of conception. He talked about the tiniest little member of our parish who is now in the loving arms of God. I realize how incredibly blessed we were to have the opportunity to memorialize and bury Jansen. I recognize the fact that not everybody is so blessed, which is why I'm here today. I want to help to raise awareness that women and families who have experienced a miscarriage or stillbirth or other forms of infant loss are mourning a real loss. They experience a grief that is only compounded by the fact that people ignore or downplay their grief or say hurtful things, whether intentionally or unintentionally. If you've suffered a loss, I am so sorry for your loss. Please know that you're in my prayers. And if you encounter someone who's experienced such a loss, please recognize that suffering by offering your sympathy and prayers to them. My child was called by God, by name, and my child's name is Jansen Benedict. I just want to thank Patrick, Sue, and Jackie for your witness. It's really beautiful. Um, I was going to do a summation, but they really kind of did it within their own talks. But maybe some of you um, may wonder, well, why would we, you know, you're a pro-life organization, why you post something on miscarriage? You're fighting abortion, right? But it all comes down to the dignity of the human person, whether that child is lost through uh, miscarriage, um, stillbirth, or through abortion. So I hope that this will encourage you that um, to, if you haven't grieved a loss, to maybe open up your heart to grief and give it to God and give your child a name. And that um, we will pray for those who have lost their babies through miscarriage um, and invite you to be a loving support and acknowledge the dignity of their children. So at this point, we're opening up the floor for any question and uh, questions, and um, for our panelists, and uh, they're available if you'd like any questions answered at this point. I just wanted to say I'm sorry for your loss. My mom had uh, lost five children, and um, we still talk. So they've always been a part of our family, and I just wanted to say I encourage people, it's a, as a sibling of five brothers and sisters or whomever in heaven, please talk about them with your children. My parents did. It was one of the greatest gifts they gave us. So thank you. I'm sorry. My mom still cries, and she's eight. Pastor Moss? Yeah, I want to say thank you all for your courage to stand one of the things, all three of you are Catholic, right? Well, I want to know what some of these Protestant friends, do you see a difference in how uh, you mentioned it about a lot of people are not educated on uh, dealing with this? And have you noticed that amongst Protestant folks also? That they're ignorant of really, you know, the same talking point. They have no clue. Um, my my brother-in-law and sister-in-law left the Catholic Church and they um, are Protestant. So when we lost our baby and we were going to have the burial service, they like really struggled because they thought I was crazy. Like, why are you doing this? And um, I know that they talked with their Christian friends 
And so the, someone wise told them, like, it's a baby, you should go, you should support, it's real. So um, from my personal experience, um, I, I think all of us need to be educated, Catholics, Christians, all of us. And so you're probably the one that's going to be called to, like, get that movement going. <laughs> In the, you know, but I, it, it's needed everywhere. It's not, like, I, I feel that it's lacking in the Catholic community. And, and just from my own personal experience, my family, I feel like it's lacking in the Protestant community. So we all need to join together and work on it. Anybody else? My daughter had a miscarriage. Doesn't want to talk about it. Never wanted to talk about it. I was there for her that day. And then she just doesn't want to talk about it. So, I know you have different feelings than her, but is there anything different you think I should do to help her? I would just say be there for her. And I would just tell you that you should probably just say, I know this is painful for you. And Sue and I are finding this as we're starting up a ministry at St. Helens. That there are people that just don't want to talk about it. But I think the best thing you can do is tell, tell her that you love her and you're there for her whenever she's ready. Because it's a process. Grieving, we all grieve in different ways. And we all grieve in different times. And believe me, she will someday start that process. And just let her know you love her and you're there for her when she's ready. So I'm sorry for your loss because it's your grandbaby. You lost your grandchild. So I would encourage you to mourn your grandchild and to maybe share some of the things you've done. Like, are you Catholic? Yeah. So maybe have a mass said for your grandbaby and then just say casually to your daughter, um, you know, I had, did she name her baby? Like, you could just say baby in her last name, like baby. Um, and just say, I, you know, I just want you to know I'm going to mass at St. Helens and there's a, you know, there's a mass for your baby. But you're a grandbaby, you're a grandma, so allow yourself to mourn. And you could do the same things, mourn your child, and maybe when you feel the time is appropriate, share with her how you're mourning and how you're honoring your baby. And there's a candle that you can bring home for your baby that we'll talk about in a moment. But don't be afraid for you to mourn your grandbaby. Oh, this is for Sue. Okay. Did your doctor know about the house bill? And is he the one who advised you? Because I've never heard about this health care for 30 years. I've never heard about this. My doctor did not know about it. Um, they're supposed to know about it because the house, I have it with me if anyone wants to look at it. It's like 20 pages long. But, um, so I, when I went into the hospital, I was, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a mom who lost a baby. So all I said was, State Bill 175 says that I have the right to my baby back, and that's all I knew. So I just kept on saying that to all the doctors and nurses and medical personnel, and they're like, ooh, <laughs> she knows what she's talking about. I didn't, you know. But that is a problem. Um, that's something else that we as a pro-life community need to do. We need to educate because 99% of the people do not know about that law. I only found out about it just through doing research. Um, so, I educated my doctor just from my own personal experience. And he was very supportive. Did I answer your question? Anybody else? Is this addressed to a certain person? Would you? No. Okay. Uh, well, yes, yeah, Sue, in particular. <laughs> uh, they say that, you know, you said that you had it said to you, Things always happen for a reason. And I found that uh, things that happen, person, people with an illness, friends of theirs, relatives of theirs are all of a sudden drawn to the church to pray for that person. And, and it brings them to the church. When that nurse wrote in big letters, baby, that nurse was changed. And people around her are changed just by her recognizing that and proclaiming that. Right. So she's not going to forget that. When that happens again, 
she's, she's going to remember you. Thank you. And I'll never forget her either. But thank you for sharing, sharing that with me. A priest told me when I was mourning my baby in confession, he said, Sue, and he said, same thing, everything happens for a reason. He goes, just you and searching for that baby, you have no clue how many people were surprised that a baby, that a mom wanted her baby back. And yet, he said that that himself was a witness. But that was all God's doing, all God's grace. But thank you for sharing that with me. Anna? They did not use the word specimen. I have I have it right here if you'd like to look at it. Oh yeah, okay. I'm saying are the hospitals by law since what they're I, regulated by House Bill 175, are they they're oh. supposed to by law, according to this law, the hospitals are supposed to inform everybody that women have a right to their baby back. Um, and they're supposed to but no one's educated. So I feel like that's something that the pro-life community needs to do is ed go into the doctor's offices, go into the hospitals, and ed like this form, you know, that I showed you that you're all welcome to come back and see. I don't know if somehow someone, I'm not a lawyer, but maybe it's an idea if someone could take that upon themselves and go into different doctor's offices and hospitals and change the form to say baby instead of specimen or device. And I'm just asking, does the actual verbiage in the bill refer to the baby as a baby? I, I have it here. I remember the word fetus. I don't okay, remember. So fetus, and right. they're, they're using... The hospitals are using specimen and device, right. okay. but the bill said fetus. Okay, so I feel they should use what the bill right. uses, which is fetus. Right. Okay, thank you so much for the ministry that you're sending. Oh, thank you. It should say the deceased. Because that's I what agree. they are. You know, deceased. I agree. So you like you would uh, uh, anybody. Um, I don't know if you heard Clara Bryant said she said they should also sit, they should imagine that the baby is deceased because they are human beings that die. And that brings up a good point because the house that bill also says that you're allowed to have a death certificate for your baby. Um, and I have papers from Matt Lynch that shows how to go about that, too, that I brought with me if you want to look at that also. Okay, at this time, um, we're going to have Jackie and Sue uh, share. Uh, they started a ministry. It's called Our Ladies Nursery at St. Helens, and they're just going to briefly tell you a little bit about that. Um, like Jackie said, Jackie Chiquillo and I are starting a ministry at St. Helens that it's open to all people who would like to come from all over the county um, or beyond. And we're, we titled it Our Ladies Nursery. Um, the purpose of this ministry is that we want to reach out to help others through this ministry who are suffering through, you know, due to the loss of stillbirth, abortion, miscarriage. 
we believe that if we respect life from the moment of conception, why not? We should be taking care to honor and memorialize our babies who have died during miscarriage, stillbirth, and other forms of infant loss. So we want to bring awareness. And she's So our purpose and our mission is we're offering prayer, support, resources, education, and community outreach to remove the stigma and the ignorance associated with infant loss. We want to help touch, heal, and make others aware of this silent sorrow. And we want to give those suffering from this silent sorrow the assurance that they have the right and the need to mourn their loss. We hope to eventually start to educate doctors, nurses, and medical staff our parish community and our community at large. We're going. We're, we're starting up a support group with monthly meetings where we'll pray, discuss our losses, and help others cope with their loss. We're going to have silent sorrow gift bags to hand out, and we actually have a sample of one over on our table. We're also going to be adding monthly mass intentions for the children that are resting in Our Lady's nursery, and we're going to mail cards to families who have lost a child on their due date or the anniversary of their loss. Jackie and I have talked about how we feel like this is like a missing link in the pro-life movement and we'd love to encourage all of you if you guys could help us or you have talents that could educate the community to help us because, you know, we're just two moms. <laughs> we could use your help. But this is really important in the pro-life community. Like some people thought, like, what does miscarriage have to do with the, you know, the pro-life laws? It has everything to do with it. Because we take care of our babies who we lost through miscarriage. People who are considering abortion are going to see that we truly care about those babies and those babies have dig dignity. And if, they, if we're open about our grieving and if they see us memorialize them, they're going to be more apt to rethink about what they're doing as far as their abortion. Um, there's different ways we want to honor and memorialize our babies. On October 15th, I'm not sure if you're aware that that is a national, it was instituted by Ronald Reagan. It's National Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day. So this past October 15th, Jackie and I did a um, mass with Father Jay to remember all the babies in our parish and beyond who died during miscarriage, abortion, stillbirth. Um, we're in the works of trying to have Our Lady's Nursery Memorial Garden with memorial plaques to honor all babies who've been lost through miscarriage and infant loss. We are going to have a book of life and a certificate of life in our church underneath the painting um, that Patrick, Mike, Mike of course see me did the painting, but the painting is back there on the wall. Um, Father Jay said we could put the painting in our church and it's called the Nursery of Heaven and um, we're going to have a book of life underneath that honoring our babies. And then we're also going to try to put messages in our parish bulletin on what to do in the event of a loss. We want to educate people before they have to lose their baby so they know what to do when they're in that situation. We want to show um, ways to memorialize your baby if you're not able to bury your child. Um, we want to say things you should not say to people who is grieving the loss of their infant. And we're going to try to eventually get a website too. But one of the ways that when we had the mass at our parish, we made candles. Oh, good. <laughs> so this, this is modeled after the painting, The Nursery of Heaven by Michael Corsini. And up here it says, Our Lady's Nursery. And then Jackie came up with this wonderful phrase. It says, Called by God, cradled by Our Lady, and forever in our hearts. And on the bottom we have the quote from Scripture that says, I have called you by name, you are mine. So for any of you who have the grandbabies, sisters, brothers, that you want to memorialize, we encourage you to bring home a candle, and on the bottom, right here in this blue blue space, put the name of your baby or your grandbaby. And, you know, it's not one per family, it's one per child. So if you think, I have five miscarriages, you go home with five candles, because each child should be represented, and we will help you after the program. Okay, before we close with prayer, um, we want to give you a final opportunity if you want to purchase any raffle tickets or if you have not put your uh, free ticket in for the drawing for two books, you have this opportunity now. And um, 
We will also need help tearing, tearing down, putting chairs away if you're able to stay to help us with that. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Pastor Walt Moss. Um, he is an active black pro-life leader, and he serves as our um, black outreach pro-life um, coordinator for Lake County Right to Life. So please give him a warm welcome. said I can say something for the prayer. Thank you, Jackie. We thank all of you for being here. We want to thank uh, uh, help from St. Helen and also the Lake County Right to Life. And these two organizations really support our ministry. And uh, if you didn't know, Darlene and I were in uh, the West Coast March for Life. We were in Oakland on that Friday, the Friday at the marches in Washington, D.C. We were in Oakland at the Oakland Rally in March. I spoke at the Oakland rally, and we marched. And then Saturday in San Francisco, we were at the, uh, it called the Info Fair, and, and this uh, rally. And then we marched um, at the uh, rally. Uh, before the march, uh, we go up on the stage at the end with uh, Pastor Clinard Children's. He uh, shared the message. And it was just so awesome to stand up on the stage. Some of you might have saw it if you watched it on the Catholic Network. We were standing there and to look out at over 70,000 people who came. And so each year, it's our sixth year in the San Francisco March. And every year that march has grown. And there's so many young people. And that's really what has really uh, blessed me. And so I want to thank all of you for what you do uh, in the pro-life movement. And thank Lake again, Lake County, right to life, and uh, the Ministry of Health. So let's give them a hand clap. Amen. Now I got to share this because this morning I was in Uriesville, Ohio, preaching, and uh, you know, I didn't know that you all were going to be sharing what you share, but this it all relates. So six years ago, and some of you probably didn't know this. God gave me a ministry to pray for uh, couples that can have not been able to conceive. I remember years ago I prayed in Africa for a couple, and they uh, they uh, contacted us in a couple months and said the wife for the first time was pregnant. And there's been many cases around the country where we prayed. Recently, I was in a restaurant, and a young we were going out, Darlene and I. I don't know it was our anniversary. <laughs> 32 years, and we were a young lady waitress was telling us, oh, we've been married for seven years and I haven't been able to get pregnant. And I said, well, can I pray for you? And at work recently, a young lady that works was telling me, they've been married, she's been married eight years. And I said, well, can I pray for you? So I'm still waiting to hear. But a young lady at this, I was at this church today, and there was a young lady that I prayed for uh, six years ago. I hadn't been at this church for so long. I was there in past years, the pastor was a female pastor, and uh, she would have, she supported me in my ministry to Cuba, uh, and then uh, she died, this pastor, and this was her uh, daughter, and uh, I didn't know when the, uh, no one called me, I didn't know they had her funeral last week, so I was really disappointed, so the new pastor had called me a month ago to come and preach today at their church. So the young lady, uh, uh, six years ago, was saying, well, I can't get pregnant. We've been married five, six, seven, eight years. And, and I called her up front in the congregation, and I had the pastor, the, the uh, mother, pray to lay her hands on her. And I had my hand on her stomach, and we just believed God was going to make her womb fertile. Amen? Amen. So uh, today she showed me the little, she had twin, two boys, six years old. But in the midst of the conversation, she said that uh, a couple years ago that she was pregnant again. And now you got to remember that the service hadn't started. And so she, we were talking during the fellowship time. And I couldn't really respond because she said it so fast. And the only thing I could say is, your baby's in heaven. But, you know, I really, really wanted to say, well, I'm sorry. But because it happened so fast, the only thing I could say to her your baby is in heaven. But what I am going to do is I'm going to buy three of these books and I'm going to give send her one. Because everything you all said is so true and so powerful. 
Now, I've been in the ministry for 40-something years. The last church I pastored for 18 years. And in that time, I had one uh, member's sister call. She was in the hospital. She had a miscarriage. And she was insisting that I come up there and pray. Uh, pray over her and the baby in her womb before the hospital do whatever they do. And I did. I just did it out. I felt like, wow, she's never asked me. And she didn't come to church. Her sisters were members. And I did that because I really felt that that was important to her. And I did that. And sometimes, you know, you say, we do it. We don't really think about it. But for that young lady, I remember that day, she wanted, she wasn't a church member, but she wanted that done. And I remember going to Altman Hospital, and I did that. Uh, my daughter was pregnant in New York. We are, we, she has three children. Before that, she had lost twins. And, and I'm thinking what, what, what I heard today is sometimes we just don't think about it. That it is a lie. The babies are babies. And what I shared at the, with the congregation today, I want to share this passage with you. Psalms 90 verse 9. I use this at a lot of funerals, but when they were talking about these babies, it really hit my heart. Psalms 90 verse 9. For our, all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. And so when they were talking, I was thinking about this. I, I shared this today. And I, was, and I shared at many funerals, but today it really hit me because Sam has a tale, a life. And I talk about a book, that our lives are books. God said there's a beginning and an end. He had a beginning and an end. And so that's why his life, every baby's life, God said let it be. So the next time somebody tell you, oh, it, it, Psalms 90, verse 9, God is the one that gives life. Amen? Amen. All right. Come on, give God a hand clap, y'all. Come on. Amen. So I want to say thank you all again for your support. Um, we make, we feel like we believe we're making some headway especially in the African-American community with some of the pastors. We got much work to do, but thank God for President Trump. Yes. And uh, we were so happy that he did go to the uh, March for Life and speak there in Washington. Uh, I listened to it, we were on our way into Oakland that day, and I had it on my phone live stream, and I had goosebumps as he was speaking. Every life matters, and I again want to say thank all of you. And so let's stand, and we'll close uh, in prayer this time. And don't forget to get your book, because I think all of us know somebody that these books can help. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you. Well, I'm supposed to do the prayer in the portion. Uh, I'm going to do it, but I'm so caught up, I'm so full <laughs> and excited about what I heard today. So let's do the prayer to end abortion, then I'll do my Protestant prayer. Is that all right? <laughs> all right. Lord God, I, am, I thank you today for the gift of my life. Oh, I thought we all knew it by heart. Okay, I'm sorry. So I, I need to let you re, just repeat after me then. We'll do it like that, like we do in a Protestant church. Is that all right? <laughs> so just repeat after me. Lord God, I thank you today. For the gift of my life. And for the lives of all my brothers and sisters. I know there is nothing that destroys more life than abortion. Yet I rejoice that you have conquered death by the resurrection of your son. I am ready to do my part in ending abortion. Today I commit myself never to be silent, never to be passive, never to be forgetful of the unborn. I commit myself to, to be active 
in the pro-life movement and never to stop defending life until all my brothers and sisters are protected and our nation once again becomes a nation with liberty and justice not just for some but for all through Christ our Lord now, Father, thank you for all that we've heard today. We thank you for the pro-life movement. Thank you for this gathering here today. Lord, we do lift you up. We thank you, Father, for every baby in the womb today. We thank you, Father, for the families, Lord. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren. Lord, thank you for the life that you've given all of us. And we will worship you. We will serve you. And we thank you again for this time here together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Okay, uh, Steve, are we ready for the drawing? And also, if there's any um, of you that want to come forward and to um, get a, a memorial candle, either for yourself or for a loved one that um, has lost a child through miscarriage, um, please uh, come up to the table here and take a candle. Thank you.